very famous painting where Picasso is revealing the depths of despair, tortured lives of prostitutes. Gauguin, uh, around about this time too, um, Europeans were going to and discovering places where indigenous people um, lived and Gauguin spent many years working in Tahiti and this painting is also strikingly different from what was being done in Europe at the time in its high colour tones and, um, and also the congruence, if you like, between the, the human forms and the forms in the environment. There's a real reflection of that indigenous knowledge of connectivity between ourselves and the natural world. Now back in Europe, and this is um, Edward Wilson, um, just a little bit later, Wilson uh, is clearly a traditionally trained European artist, very fine detail, very accurate. He's also a scientist. But there's, a, there's an elemental nature in, in the composition of this and in other of his works. He's clearly at one with the natural world that he's observing as a scientist. So he's a per beautiful example of, of the art and the science, all the analytic and the sensory coming together. And I believe, I suggest that it's his work in the Antarctic, the fact that he did so much of his work in the Antarctic, that lends itself to this elemental um, quality in his work. It's probably quite, would have been quite weird for the people back in Europe to, to see this sort of stuff. Another example of a, a scientist who's, who's also an artist is um, Sir Alistair Hardy. He was also an inventor, um, as are many scientists today. And he's famous, well, he's, I'm very fond of him because he likes krill and crustaceans, and, and they're my animal, I suppose. But he's also very well known for initiating one of the longest, well, it is, is it the longest, Peter? The longest? Um, plankton. Plankton recording survey. Mm -hmm. So it started in 19, <laughs> 1931, yeah, and this is a way he, he Hardy designed a machine to deploy into the back of ships and be towed along and to, within strips of mesh, to feed the tiny organisms, the phytoplankton typically, and zooplankton. And I won't go into this argument about zooplankton and our krill zooplankton or not, but there are smaller things than krill that, that we call zoo, zooplankton and phytoplankton, which are the plants or of, of the sea. And they're gathered up into this into this mesh in this machine, which is a little bit like a cigarette rolling machine with double strips of silk, which you saw in the previous picture with one of my images on. And from gathering this up, they can scientists are able to monitor the abundance and distribution of phytoplankton in the ocean. And one way that they do this, which is quite a quick way, and I don't know if you want to validate this, but it's just to put it up to the light and see how green it is. That's one thing that I've heard that they do. It's a very quick way and, and surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, it usually correlates with the incredibly long-winded, tedious data collection that is also done um, to count the critters within the, um, the mesh. So I'm going to show you now an animation that is projected into this mesh and it's an animation that came from conversations with Martina and also um, Jennifer with, about um, Pumasara Banksiae, a form of macro algae or large algae that you might be familiar with here in, in the coast of Sydney. But I've also, you'll, you'll also recognise in this the primal gestural form of, of, of the great ape, which I've used to signify the one solid point of Earth's rotation in Antarctica. And so the form of Antarctica, which has been used, as you'll see in some imagery soon, to signify because of the shape. It looks very like a human brain. It also resembles a fetus. And, um, and the human breath is 
signified by alveoli. Now, how do I get this to play? Because this is, yeah, here we go. And the music is by an 11-year-old girl. Now we could talk for a long time, couldn't we, Martina, about how that came to be, but I have to keep talking. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so behind all of these um, things I'm showing you, it's like just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much knowledge, so much research that's gone into how we understand these things are happening. I'm going to show you now um, an animation of this is the Antarctic Krill, and this is actually probably what I'm best known for, is the Krill sex animation, which happened quite by accident. Some scientists I was working with accidentally observed the entire mating sequence of Antarctic Krill. They deployed a camera to the sea floor in Antarctica, actually to look at something else. They were looking for benthos, which are animals that look a bit like plants that live on the bottom of the ocean. They're very beautiful. So on the ship there were Krill biologists and people looking at benthos and they all gathered around this little TV screen at this footage that had only just come up and the benthos scientist said to So Kawaguchi, my krill biologist and colleague, your krill are getting in the way of our benthos, we can't see a thing. And sure enough there was this seething, teething, seething mass of krill and I haven't got a picture to show you unfortunately, but within that mass, uh, So was able to identify a gravid or pregnant female krill pursued by two males and they did this dance and very grungy quality video and they just didn't know what to do, how, how are we going to find out what's happening here. So they gave it to me and I traced the video frame by frame and I figured out when was the most likely point of connection for example, what might be going on, it was so, you'll see the tracing in a minute and so details of the story are filled in by reading papers on similar um, crustaceans and, and their mating behaviours and what is the most likely story that we can make of, the, of this data. The music um, came quite by accident too. It's music by one of the Benthos scientists and I'd only spoken to him on the phone about this and coming down to the video and he happened to be a musician and that night after I'd asked him, well, what's it like down there? He, he improvised this piece of music.
was a real insight for me. That was my first real insight into how science happens, how you, how you make up stories from all the information that you have at that time, building on all the research that's gone beforehand into these sorts of phenomena. It's a very creative process. Um, it's not that you're making up a story, you're not just making it up, you're making up a story that best fits the data. So this is um, a poster that we came up with to show at science conferences that shows that the entire sequence, that the pattern, and as you can see it's, it's quite fluid, um, it's gorgeous, and it means a lot to us because of what we know it means. And why this is important is because knowing where the breeding grounds of creatures of the sea are and, and where these critters are reproducing, and I'm including plants as well as animals, is vital for us to understand so that we can protect these, these areas from exploitation, pollution and so on. So it was not known before this that Antarctic krill had sex on the sea floor. Oh, okay. So this is now, uh, this is an animation that you might have noticed all the little dots around the crew.